Hi, my name is Dmitry, and today I'm going to talk about a new covered channel that we discovered with my colleagues in Edinburgh. If you follow news, security breaches happen regularly, despite the great attention and efforts that both companies and governments pay to cybersecurity today. In this talk, I focus on data breaches in cloud and data centers. Unfortunately, breaches happen everywhere, and cloud is no exception. Primarily because of widely spread spyware and newly and continuously discovered side channels. When a breach has already happened, the only way to prevent this information leak is to contain this information within a secure environment, this allowing the attacker to communicate the stolen secrets to their collaborators in the outside world. In order to contain possible leaks, system designers and cloud providers introduce a number of isolation layers, such as processor and network virtualization. You can think of these isolation layers as fences. Many, many fences that are deployed in today's public cloud. So the spy needs to breach several of these isolation layers. Um, and can we now assume that information in the secure cloud environment would be contained even if it gets stolen? Unfortunately, the answer is no. There are techniques called covered channels that allow to bypass these isolation layers like this smart bison jumps over a fence. In covered channels, the attacker usually communicates with legitimate, innocuous actions that usually have nothing to do with regular network packets, making it difficult to monitor it. For example, a timing covered channel implies that both sender and the receiver share some resource, like a CPU cache, and the sender can purposefully slow down and speed up the access time to that resource um, and transmit zeros and ones with this access time changes. Covered channels pose a real danger because they allow to bypass isolation layers while appearing completely innocent. One very dangerous type of covered channels is network covered channels where the sender and the receiver can communicate while sharing the same physical network. Hence, network cover channels may breach several isolation layers at once. This type of channels started to appear recently at the scientific venues. Well, some people would think of network channels as just a research toy, because networks are believed to have a lot of systems noise, so that one may conclude that constructing a timing channel in a public cloud is impractical. But are the modern networks noisy? Today, many of public cloud providers advertise RDMA networks. These networks feature much lower latency and much higher bandwidth. The secret source of RDMA networks is that RDMA network packets completely bypass the CPU of the destination node and access so-called remote memory directly. In an RDMA setting, a node in the cluster can allocate memory space on the other nodes in the same cluster. This memory region belongs to only that node which allocated it, and none of the other nodes can access it without a permission. Let's look at the figure now. Say node A allocated a remote memory region in node B's memory, so that node A can access its private data with RDMA read operation. When node A's CPU sends an RDMA read, it goes through the network and the destination NIC, and the NIC at the destination reads the data from node B's memory without involving the CPU. And this is why RDMA networks deliver low latency and bandwidth as high as hundreds of gigabits per second. Given this huge network bandwidth, how does it compare to memory bandwidth? in a modern server. Well, NICs offer 100 gigabit per second, but modern CPUs feature hundreds of gigabytes per second, which is an order of magnitude higher than the NIC bandwidth. So from the first glance, the network bandwidth is smaller than the memory bandwidth. But is this statement truly right? Well, we need to take a closer look. In reality, DRAM scaling ended decades ago and memory vendors keep scaling memory bandwidth just by increasing the number of internal devices called banks. 
each band calls and serves the request to a fraction of the memory. A bank serves one request at a time and acts like a first-in, first-out structure that can offer only 10 gigabit per second, which is about 10 times lower than today's unique bandwidth. As a result, network traffic can easily congest a memory bank if the traffic is targeted. We exploited this bandwidth disparity between the NIC and the memory bank bandwidth to construct a high-rate, extremely stealthy covered channel that works across an entire RDMA cluster. We call this channel bankrupt. The bankrupt channel allows a spy or a sender to communicate the secret to the receiver, which runs on another node in an RDMA cluster using one more completely unrelated innocuous node uh, that we call intermediary. The intermediary node is located in the same RDMA network. So to communicate, the sender steers um, the RDMA network traffic to one memory bank of the intermediary and modulates this bank's service time. The receiver is able to independently, independently from the sender, locate and periodically probe that bank and reconstruct the signal in the contention timing channel that forms inside that bank. Now I'll show you how to construct the bankrupt channel in an arbitrary RDMA cluster. First, both the sender and the receiver need to find addresses that map to the same bank inside the intermediary's memory. However, the sender and the receiver have to independently choose their own set of addresses within their own private regions, because remember, the sender and the receiver don't share any memory. Second, the sender needs to determine few communication parameters, such as how many RDMA requests, RDMA packets to, to send in a burst, and how often to issue this burst. That is gonna be the transmission frequency. Finally, the receiver needs to define the frequency of the probes that is sufficient to decode the transmitted signal. Let us start with finding the addresses that belong to the same band. But first, let's recall the basics of virtual memory. When software reads or writes to memory, it operates with virtual addresses that need to be translated into physical addresses. Translation happens at the page granularity and uh, RDMA operations also use virtual addresses of the host CPU so that the virtual addresses of RDMA re reads and writes need to be translated into physical addresses before accessing memory. This means that if you look at the virtual and physical addresses, the low order bits responsible for, for the cache block and page offsets are the same for the corresponding virtual addresses and the physical addresses. Some of the physical address bits define the location of the bank that hosts that part of memory. Here we call them bank bits for simplicity. These bits usually reside in the low order part of the physical address to the left of the cache block offset. Now it becomes clear how to find virtual addresses that belong to the same bank. Well, just set the bank bits to the same value, for example, to zero. So in order to locate the required set of addresses, the attacker needs to locate the bank bit's position in a physical address. Okay, now we are ready to walk through the iterative algorithm uh, to search for, for the addresses. Um, so the attacker first chooses arbitrary addresses in their private memory region, making sure that the addresses are not inside the same cache block because the hardware would call as this request. Hence, the attacker sets six low order bits to zero. Then, the attacker issues RDMA reads to the addresses it chose and measures the amount of network traffic that it can push to the remote memory. Note that the attacker is remote and cannot run any software on the intermediary node. As we learned before, the bandwidth bottleneck is in the banks and not in memory or network bandwidth. So the measured throughput would indicate how many banks of the intermediary 
observe this traffic. In the next iteration, the attacker sets one more bit to zero and repeats the experiment. We see that the traffic dropped by a half, which means that the number of banks that serve the traffic reduced by a half. Hence, bit six is the bank bit. The attacker, um, in the next iteration, there is one more bit and finds out that the traffic stays the same, which means that bit seven is not a bank bit. Continuing with the fourth iteration, uh, the attacker finds that the bit eight is a bank bit because the throughput dropped and so on. Ultimately, the attacker would find that the traffic saturates at its minimal point, that is the bandwidth of a single bank in the remote memory. It's going to be around 10 gigabit per second, but may vary across vendors. So now the attacker knows all the bank bits and it can choose addresses in that bank. The most obvious choice is to choose addresses with all bank bits equal to zero. So if both the sender and the receiver set the bank bits to zero, they can steer their traffic to one bank. This search algorithm is simple but powerful. It allows a remote attacker remote attacker to find required addresses in less than a second. Now it's time to switch to the second challenge, which lies in the communication itself, which includes the form of the bursts uh, coming from the sender and the probing frequency of the receiver. From the sender's side, the number of RDMA requests in a burst is key. Larger bursts amplify the bank service size, making it the signal more pronounced. This uh, can help to overcome network noise. However, large bursts take more time to serve, which decreases the transmission frequency of the channel. The sender and the receiver don't need to agree on, on the transmission frequency. Furthermore, the transmission frequency may change over time when, for example, the network becomes more loaded and noisy. Hence, uh, the sender sends um, fixed-sized packets that comprise a fixed a priori known preamble and also a payload with the useful information, the actual message. Um, knowing the preamble, and the packet size, the receiver can determine the transmission frequency quite reliably. The receiver also needs to issue probes to the target bank at the frequency which is higher than the transmission frequency so that it can reliably detect transmitted bits values. We find that for all platforms that we tested, setting the probing frequency to about 2 MHz is enough and increasing it further has little impact on the transmission accuracy. First, we evaluate the bankrupt cover channel um, in our small-scale private RDMA cluster. We do so both in an isolated environment and then in the presence of the artificial network load that we create. Second, we evaluate our cover channel in a large-scale research public cloud called CloudLab using a large 200 node cluster in Utah. At the time of uh, our measurements, about 80% of the nodes in the Utah cluster were in use. In the private cluster, first we evaluate the channel in isolated uh, environment. On this chart, one can see the timeline in microseconds on the horizontal axis and the network round trip to the target bank as recorded, as recorded by the receiver on the vertical axis. The top figure shows the signal transmitted with the burst size of 32, which means each burst has 32 RDMA reads in it. And this is the minimum size that allows robust decoding of the signal. The bottom figure shows the signal with a four times larger burst size, uh, which results in much stronger signal um, but lower transmission frequency. 
And in this experiment, we artificially create noise in the network by deploying a micro benchmark that sends significant amount of traffic to the intermediary node. The signal with a burst size of 32 becomes noisy and indistinguishable. However, if we increase the burst size to 128, um, the signal becomes clear and uh, it's uh, clearly visible on the top of on top of uh, the network noise. This way, the attacker is able to trade the transmission frequency to compensate for the network noise. We also evaluate how difficult it is to detect the bankrupt, ch the bankrupt channel's activity on the intermediary. First, we export uh, the CPU counters, but unfortunately, modern CPUs feature only aggregate counters that don't track memory traffic at the bank granularity. This is insufficient to identify the targeted bursts of the memory traffic. Second, we use the random access software benchmark that used hardware timestamps to measure local memory access time. We find that this metric is affected only in high order percentiles starting with the third nine. Finally, we can see their network counters, but they were not helpful because none of the network resources um, is congested during the bankrupt channel operation. So all in all, one can conclude that detecting the bankrupt channel is nearly impossible with the current software and hardware capabilities. Next, we compare the transmission accuracy and the true channel throughput <clears throat> in the private cluster and in the public cloud. We plot the burst size on the horizontal axis um, in both figures. As before, increasing the burst size allows to increase the accuracy that allows to, um, to an, uh, that also leads to an increase in throughput. However, the accuracy starts to saturate with a burst size of 32. As a result, increasing the burst size beyond 32 leads to a reduction in the throughput because larger bursts limit the transmission frequency. We were able to achieve a similar transmission accuracy in both clusters. However, we had to increase the size of the preambles when transmitting in CloudLab for more reliable decoding. So the bankrupt channel in CloudLab achieved 20% less throughput. The takeaway from this slide is that one needs to find the burst size that would allow high enough accuracy and high enough transmission frequency. In this talk, I seek to attract your attention to the problem of covert channels, demonstrating how vulnerable the data in public cloud can be. I showed how to construct a high rate and extremely stealthy covert channel that we called bankrupt. Uh, this covert channel relies on the discrepancy of the network and memory bank bandwidth. We showed how an attacker can communicate to a receiver that runs on, on another node in the same RDMA cluster using a congestion timing channel inside the remote memory of another unrelated node in the same RDMA network. The bankrupt channel shows significant throughput and robustness even in a noisy public cloud network. Now please see the paper for other details such as mitigation strategies Thank you for your attention. We published our proof of concept code uh, for Bankrupt on GitHub, so please take a look. And um, I would welcome any questions. Thank you.